All right, folks, welcome to the Power Ranking Show for week 22. We do this live on Twitter Spaces every single Tuesday morning. And then, of course, if you're watching on YouTube right now, we put it the top 10 on YouTube as well. So welcome. Let's get to it, and let's get to number 10. Jump it off, Doyle. D.C. United up three spots after beating the Philadelphia Union, who dropped out of the top 10. This was a big win for them. Yeah, Hernando Sada was pumped up, but also they'd lost three straight before that. So, you know, while we're going to praise DC here, it is not perfection necessarily for the red and black. No, it, it's not. But I, I think I would argue that the, the, the drop off from Bill Hamid to uh, to, to John Kempin is maybe the, the sharpest drop between starting goalkeeper and, and, and second string goalkeeper in in the entire league. And I think you could. You could pretty much put all three of those losses uh, at the feet of 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 that that gap between Hamid and Kempin. So I, I think the, that there, there were noise in those results. Um, there's a little bit more signal in the underlying numbers for DC United, and the underlying numbers really like this team. Um, and we they we saw why against Philly. Uh, Jim Curtin said in the, in the post game, like we haven't had our asses kicked like that in about three years. Uh, and he's right. Like DC from the first minute, we're just all over the union, um, stretching them out, uh, you know, horizontally being able to get behind them. Great finishes. Like the one you're seeing right now, if you're watching it on YouTube from, from uh, Jordy Reyna, multiple runners in the box. Lasada has this team playing, uh, the type of vertical pressing soccer that we've gotten used to from from the Red Bulls, but playing it infinitely better than the Red Bulls this year. And they're offering more in terms of build-up play, combination play around the box, and honestly, just pure aesthetics. Uh, it's been a lot of fun to watch. It's not just all vertical and, and smash. Um, there, there are some... There's some real ballers in this side uh, and getting them healthy. Guys like Edison Flores, Ramon Abila, and of course, Ola Kamara is having a monster year. It's fun. I have a lot of DC United stock. I don't think this team's going away down the stretch, even though they've done dealt with a ton of injuries. Like you can tell probably from, you know, how, how long I'm going on here. I really, really like this yeah. DC United team and how side has got them playing. If you have not heard Hernan Osada speak about his team and sort of wax poetic, go check out Extra Time. We had him in the last couple of weeks. It's it's all a blur for me, so I don't know exactly when that <laughs> is, but go scroll through your podcast feed. He, you know, I think they've used 27. It might be on 28 or 29 players at this point. They haven't done it with Edison Flores, with the DP that was supposed to be the game changer for them. He's yeah. coming back. He's back with Peru. You see him enjoying himself once again. Uh, what stands out to me, though, is it felt like he could have lost this team early. Mm -hmm. It felt like the way he came in and – just sort of like ripped out the foundation and said, Hey, what we were doing, what DC was doing is not the way that I'm going to do it. And I know the better way uh, was there was a possibility it was going to rub players the wrong way, which I think it did. And then it also led to a lot of injuries and there could have been, and a lot of outgoing people, let's say in the, uh, in the sports health side of it for them, mm -hmm. that could have been a disaster for Hernan Lasada. It ended up not being a disaster. And I give him the credit for that in showing them the vision showing them that it could work, sticking with it, not wavering. And then once you start getting results and you start playing the way that they're playing, which, you know, look, if you're quote unquote kicking the ass of the other team, we all know how much fun that is. We all know how much that brings you together. And I think back to a scene a couple of weeks ago where final whistle, dramatic win. He's got the guys on the team. You know, he's got uh, Areola. He's got Kevin Predis, who's become a massive piece and may not be there for long. He's got, uh, I can't remember who else it was. It might have been Ola, it might have been Flores, whoever it was, giving him hugs after the final whistle. This feels like a group that just inherently believes in what they're doing. And in yeah. Major League Soccer, if you can get to that point as a manager, you are probably going to make the playoffs. Yeah, it, it, it certainly seems that that way. Now, um, it's, it's still not a given, right? Because they're in, in seventh place. I said, I said probably for a reason. Yeah, yeah you're, and you're right. Um, and and the, big, the big thing, I think, from here on out, um, is making sure that, that Ola Kamara stays healthy. And now, granted, they have Ramon Avila now. They have Nigel Roberta, who they signed this offseason, who they like quite a bit. But Ola has been the difference maker for them over the course of this season and managing his minutes, making sure he doesn't pick up a soft tissue injury because, like, look, man, if he plays throughout September the way he's played through, you know, from June, July, and August – we're talking about a guy who's like a dark horse MVP candidate at that point. 
He's been he's been remarkable. Um, so they have to keep him healthy. That has been the big thing with DC and I this year, the big drawback is all those soft tissue injuries. Um, they have to figure that out for the stretch run because as exciting as it is right now, it could go wrong really quickly. Um, if they're suddenly down to third string at every position, how long uh, is Kevin Predis a DC United player? Let's keep it quick on this, but you know, it seems like RB Salzburg's like, Oh yeah, yeah, we, yeah. All right, we see what you're doing. Like, that, yeah. That yeah. He, I mean, I, I, I will be surprised if he's in MLS beyond 2022. I wouldn't be shocked if he's gone um, before next season. He is, you know, I think he's the best young left back prospect in the pool. I think he's better than a better prospect than George Bellow or John Tolkien or or Gomez, the kid for Louisville City, who, who's off to Real Sociedad uh, this winter. I, I, I think the world of Perez is. He's awesome. He is awesome. All right, let's keep it going. DC United at number 10. At number 9, dun, 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 down one spot after an El Trafico draw, the LA Galaxy. Yeah. This was, this was, I think it was, it was a more disappointing result, in my opinion, for LAFC than the Galaxy, but it's still the same issues for the Galaxy that Greg Vanny has been harping on for the past month, month and a half, which is defensively, they're just kind of soft. Yeah, like they, they just give up way too many high quality chances. And, you know, look, Jovlich looked great in this game and it looks like he's got goals in him. But if you keep doing that, they're just going to sort of be that middle of the pack team in the West that when it comes to the playoffs, just doesn't have what it takes to to get past a, another team when it when it's like, hey, can you not give up three goals? Well, we don't know. We just yeah. don't know. Yeah, no, I, I I think that hits the nail on the head. And, you know, Jovlich is or Jovlich, I, I I think it's a soft J, right? Jovovich yeah, is, yeah. is, you know, has looked the part of um, like a perfect Chicharito fill-in and understudy. Uh, a bunch of their other attacking pieces are now uh, starting to come good. Cabral obviously had a, a very good goal. Uh, Rivalison has been ridiculously effective at, in central midfield. Almost unbelievably effective. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, this is it, – it's he's been – remarkable but and it's to the point where i don't really expect uh you know jonathan dos santos to be back on a dp contract their 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 defensive signings have been nowhere near as good um and we saw it in this game Derek williams you know not checking his back shoulder uh sega kulabali just getting murked in the box by brian rodriguez um and jonathan bond spent most of the first half of the year bailing them out i mean he was well into the you know, goalkeeper of the year, not just goalkeeper of the year, but like newcomer of the year. He had, he had for a long while there for about the first two and a half months. And I keep track of these things. Cause we always talk about it with Matt Turner. He had the best sort of underlying yeah. goals, minus expected goals, minus goals numbers in the league at that point. And it is, it's since it's since sort of evened way, way out. And I don't personally put that on Jonathan Bond. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it, almost everybody regresses to the meet, right. And, yeah. and that's, that, that's exactly what's happening with Bond. And now that he's not Superman anymore, the guy, Gal- I mean, the Galaxy have given up 35 goals. That's not a, that's not a, a, a playoff team's defensive record. And Greg Vanny knows it. Um, so I, I, ju- I honestly just think you hit the nail on the head. They're going to have to figure out how to stop giving up so many high quality chances and how, when they go forward, how to leave themselves um, less vulnerable to transition moments because anytime they turn the ball over now, it's a five alarm fire. I mean, we're watching on YouTube right now, this Brian Rodriguez goal. And this is, <laughs> if you're Greg Vanny and you're watching this fury, you have to just, you have to, and I, I thought his quote after the game was super interesting. And he was like, look, it is what it is, but we are going to be watching that and knowing it was us on highlight reels for 20 years. And then he actually has personal experience with this. He brought up a 97 game against the Wiz or were they the Wizards at that point? Whichever. Uh, where Precky like shredded LA, and he's like, "I watched that for a literal decade, and I know <laughs> that we're going to be doing the same thing here." We're now seeing Yevlich with these nice little finishes, one with the left foot and one with a little flip over the top. Uh, we've talked about an extra time, sort of him and Chicharito sharing the stage in a two forward system. I I don't personally see that happening very much. Same. same. Probably just because Chicharito is not going to be. It doesn't seem like healthy for extended periods. Yeah, I, I mean, that, and I just don't think... Like, How does that work just, together with the pieces it, they have? It, the other it, pieces are, like, to get the best out of that center forward, you need Grancy, you need Cabral, you need 
you know, legit. You need Ravellison and probably Dos Santos. You need all these different pieces and effort to come in and change the game off the bench, et cetera. I just and don't the know that there's fact, room. The simple fact, Weeby, is that you don't see two poacher style center forwards yeah. playing together in, in in any team in any decent league in the world anymore. I'm I'm trying to think about the last time I saw it and it it just doesn't exist. Now I'm sure there will be moments at the end of the you know end of a game where they need to throw the kitchen sink and both of those guys are out there, but it's not going to be a regular thing. And Greg Vanny has wanted to pl- he wanted to play a four two three one in uh, in Toronto for a good long while. They didn't have the pieces there to do that because it was always Josie and Javinko up top. Um, well, now if you look at the way this team has been built out, their signings, having Efra as a playmaker coming in from the right, they have a lot of pieces to go out there and play that sort of 4-2-3-1 or more of a 4-3-3 at times if Revolution, uh, Revolution is, is, uh, is more of a regista. So I, I would not... I would not expect to see a lot of Chicharito and, and Jovalich minutes together. It'll happen, but it's not going to be their default look. All right, we'll see what happens with Chicharito. It's good news for Greg Vanny and the Galaxy that they're off this weekend. Give them a little time to recover. They've got some international absences as well to deal with. They are number nine. Let's get to number eight. The Loons, Minnesota United. Smash that unmute button. Jeff Ruder, what's up, man? How you living? Uh, <laughs> See, you know what? For us central timers, this later start is a nice thing. I like had time to make a nice breakfast scramble this morning to do a little preparation. I know, just letting you know the the lap of uh, luxury that I'm in right now. Big win against the Dynamo. The Dynamo don't win, uh, Jeff. So, so it's probably good that Minnesota came back and got this one. Where do the loons stand right now? Uh, yeah, I think that they feel better. I think that the the zero and four. Uh, kind of stink has mostly been resolved with some air fresheners around them. I I think that, uh, look, I think most seasons they have struggled to play in Houston that for whatever reason, it's not necessarily an atmosphere thing because it hard rarely is it with the Houston dynamo, but for whatever reason, the dynamo have played Minnesota well in Texas. And so for them to be able to come from behind and get two goals to get Adrian Unu with a brace to really kind of get him back into the attack after going nine straight games without a goal, uh, they, they certainly feel better about that. There are still some major stylistic issues. I think that there's some consistency problems as well with some key players and areas of the field. But uh, they they look at this point like they are going to be less of a factor in that sort of playoff bubble for seeds five through, let's say, nine than they looked like they would have been just even about a month, month and a half ago. I mean, the getting this win without Reynoso and without Ludd, who are, for my money, the, the two best uh, attacking pieces on the team. And then, obviously, as you mentioned, you know, breaking that, that months-long scoring drought um, and putting the ball in the back of the net. I, I actually think that people are kind of sleeping on Minnesota at this point. They've proved defensively that they're very solid. Now um, they're going to have the pieces to – no, I don't think they're going to be the very, you know one of the very best teams in the league, but it's not far off that, Jeff. Yeah, it's not. But I also need to try to keep my keep in mind that this is the 2021 Houston Dynamo, right? And I think that any sort of any sort of points you can get away from home, Major League Soccer, always good. Any wins you can get on the road, Major League Soccer, always great. But mm-hmm. some away wins weigh more than others, and some naturally have to weigh less. And I think that you're still continuing to see home results, uh, drop points against San Jose, drop points against Kansas City, uh, drop points against the Galaxy, where those are the games where you're not necessarily cementing your place in the top seven or top five, but that's where you're actually able to climb into the top four, which is where this team still wants to be after finishing fourth in the West over the last two years. Uh, You mentioned Reynoso and Lode. I completely agree with you two most important players probably on that team because you've seen greater depth in defense. You've seen players like Brent Coleman, like DJ Taylor step in and do well to fortify uh, along the back line. You've seen the midfield rotation, Will Trapp doing what Will Trapp does. Ozzy Alonso is starting to kind of refine some of that form you saw in, let's say, 2019, not necessarily a Sounders vintage. And you're not seeing that same sort of depth or quality goal scoring options in the final third. And that's what's really holding this team back. It feels like 2019 all over again when Darwin Quintero had already checked out. Emmanuel Reynoso wasn't there yet. And they were really just trying to get a set piece or two to be able to advance in the postseason and ultimately came up fruitless that year. But 
uh, the balance is still a little bit off. I think that they're still incredibly reliant on crossing, despite not really having a crossing friendly roster. They haven't proven to be terribly good at playing through the center of the field. Uh, there was this interview that Ethan Finley did with the Star Tribune last Just week on a podcast. About that, yeah, man. go on, go on. I was going to ask you. You said stylistic issues, and and Ethan sort of laid it out. He he basically said, and I'm paraphrasing here, that like they don't really have a set way to create chances and it's it's sort of like hey just give it to to Reynoso or Robin Lud's gonna make some magic and maybe that's what maybe that's why Hunu can't get the ball in the back of the net. I know he's had his own problems, but like what did you make of those comments? Those seemed pretty pointed to me. Yeah, it reminded me of that Hey Arnold episode where there was that coach's kid named Tucker who kept getting the ball. Uh <laughs> I knew you'd like that one, Dora. Uh yeah, I, I think overall it's uh it's a big problem, right? And I think that you saw it down the stretch in 2020 with this team. The team wasn't really soaring. They weren't making it to the Western Conference Finals because Reynoso went supernova. He did. But they also had Kevin Molino, who was doing the exact same thing at the same time. And so they had a second facilitator. They had somebody else where when people were glomming on to Reynoso, when they were you know, taking him out from the shins, they could play the advantage. They could continue to go up the field with Molino, and they haven't had that player. They thought Franco Fragapane might be that guy, but he's been injured. And right now, they are really struggling to find that identity. I don't think that there was anything terribly unfair about what Finley said, where you don't really know, like, is this a team that's a pressing team? Is this a team that's going to be, you know, just uh, playing up the wing and purposely trying to create those chances for a target man? They don't have a target man on the roster. They have Fernando Adi but he doesn't necessarily have that same record of headed goals that, say, Kai Kamara does. So I think that there still is a lot of limbo about what this team actually is, but what they've proven to be is very good defensively, to have a good shape, to have really solid goalkeeping, a good resurgence here from Tyler Miller after getting that position back. But you need goals to advance in the postseason, and if opponents are going to be able to neutralize right now, so uh, goals are hard to come by for this Minnesota United side. The Fernando Adi reference there just took me completely by surprise. I mean, I've seen, I've read it, I've seen it, I saw the pictures of him in training, and I still somehow can't quite believe it. Uh, wh- how do they get there, Jeff? And then we'll let you go. How do they get there? Like they uh, injuries. <laughs> I mean, they've they've continued to have uh, for the second third year in a row a lot of. Uh, these muscle injuries and leg injuries uh, that are pulling a lot of players off the field. They, aside from Unu, didn't have another center forward on the roster before signing Fernando Adi. Uh, They had a striker retire in the middle of the season. They nullified the loan for Ramon Avila, who's suddenly looking uh, like the player they expected him to be at DC, go figure. Uh, and, And so they brought in Adi. And I think the difference between bringing in Kai Kamara last year was he was still scoring goals in recent seasons for Colorado and for Vancouver. Uh, Fernando Adi wasn't having much success in Ohio. And, and I think that uh, he had some really good interplay when he came off the bench against Houston. He, had a, uh, he actually set up the game winner, so kind of a second assist, if you will. I don't know if this league still credits those or not, but... Um, oh, you better believe we do. <laughs> good. Just making sure those, those should never go away. Um, you know, like he, he was starting to work into it, but it, it does look strange. It, it really does look like a uh, the point where you're restarting a video game safe because that player just doesn't look right in that jersey. Um, so, you know, do I think that he's going to play a major role down the stretch? No, but it is somebody who can take some pressure off of Unu. It allows him to not have to lead the line as much, which he hasn't shown to be good at. And it's just not really his game either. It gives him someone to work off of. Uh, but then at that point, you're taking off someone like Finley, someone like Fregapane, someone like Lode, and the, Adrian Heath is just going to have to decide what's more valuable to this team setup. Minnesota, fifth in the West right now, five points back of the LA Galaxy, uh, right down the middle right now. Zero goal differential, eight, six, and seven. They seem to be a playoff team. We've got to find something uh, to inspire them in the attack. Jeff Ruder over at The Athletic. Read his stuff. Follow him on Twitter. You can see it on YouTube right there at Jeff Ruder R. U-E-T-E-R. Jeff, appreciate you, man. Yep, anytime. Yep, let's go to number seven. Orlando City down one spot, a draw against Inter-Miami. Doyle, uh, they've just kind of felt to me this season like they're just kind of maintaining, 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 surviving injuries, had a bunch of big ones. Some of those seem to be coming back here soon. I mean, I think Daryl DK is starting to train maybe close to full uh nani's sort of been nursing one but pato's coming back you know he's my newcomer of the year but after all that (laughs) i say that 
they have 35 points their second. Don't even laugh at that Pato take, man. If he comes back, it's going to be yeah. something. 35 last, points. Last I saw Pato uh, had a setback. I, I, oh, I would my be, God. Yeah, you kidding yeah, me. I, I would be shocked if, if we – I mean, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about, but I, I'm not counting on uh, Pato. But we can count on, on Daryl DK to – uh, to be back because they, it's the final day of the transfer window in, in for most of Europe, I believe. And there's been not a peep said about Daryl DK that I've seen today. Um, and he did get back on the field for this one, as you mentioned. Uh, Oscar Perret has just done a, a fantastic job of, of managing this roster this year because they've had as many injuries as anyone outside of like the Sounders and, and Columbus, I want to say. Um, and, you know, the, defensively, they have stayed resolute all year long. They're very difficult to break down. Um, they've gotten some good fill-in minutes in, at goal when, excuse me, when Gaese has been out. They've managed uh, defensively with with backup fullbacks essentially for most of the season. They've had to rotate uh, the you know the the deep lying central midfield. They're still not full there, and they have just been grinding out wins. Um, and grinding out points. And obviously they're disappointed not to get the full three here, but they played well. And, and I'm of the opinion that once they have their, their full squad available, the draws like this will turn into the full three points. And the other thing it needs to be said that, that I think Perea has done exceptionally well this year is to start managing Nani's minutes. Nani doesn't ever want to come off the field i mean nani was hurt and he didn't want to miss the all-star game yeah and and he was like i have to be back to do the skills challenge <laughs> he's 34 like, 35 years peg. old it's incredible he's 34 35 years old and he's playing in the florida heat and it's just it's a challenge with anybody who has that mentality but especially one who is your highest paid star dp to to say i'm sorry man you're not starting you're getting rest this week because the stretch run, you know, being 90% fit for the stretch run is more than playing 90 minutes this week. Um, and so getting Nani to buy into that the way he has, I like, I'm very bullish on Orlando from here on out because I think they're going to be close to healthy come October and November. Um, and, and if this team is close to healthy, then they are a legitimate threat to win MLS Cup. What is Orlando City at their best, in your opinion? Because I think there was sort of a time, and, and we might have finally sort of come out of it, where every time we thought of Orlando City, we were still sort of hearkening back and 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 trying to like bottle the feelings that we had during MLS's back. Right. They were just oh, they were irresistible, yeah. and it was like, oh my God, Oscar Preja is just not only is he a whisper in terms of motivation and organization, which we always knew from the Dallas and, and Colorado days. But he has this team playing an attacking style that maybe isn't always indicative of what his teams looked like in the past. But it sort of feels like to me that we're not going to get back to that high, but that he's going to sort of chip away and find a middle ground uh, I, where they could perhaps be effective in the playoffs. I just don't know that they can get back to that particular high. Like Chris Mueller's not going to be back at that level, I don't think, in MLS. He's going to be gone at the end of the season. He's going to rest Nani, so you're not going to lean on him as much. Your fullbacks aren't quite as adventurous let's say as they were during that period uh you know daryl dk maybe if daryl gets back maybe they get there but i just i don't know I'm, I'm giving up a little bit on that orlando city and and saying it's fine to settle for extremely effective sometimes spectacular orlando city so i'm going to push back on that i think the goal is to get back to that and have daryl dk come the playoffs and I think that's the point of resting Nani. That's the point of they've reintegrated Jean Moutinho and Juan at fullbacks. And, you know, I, I assume that he's going to rotate and rest these guys as, as much as possible. And the idea, Weeby, is to play the type of soccer that they played last year, last summer in, in Orlando at the MLS's back tournament, plus have Daryl DK up top. Now, Mueller is, is a bit of the X factor. Because he was best 11 caliber last year. He has been nothing close to that this year. Um, and the other X factor is obviously health. And that's why, again, Oscar Pereja deserves a ton of praise for getting through this glut of injuries and really doing a good job rotating these guys and trying to make sure that Nani and, and Mauricio Pereira, who we haven't even mentioned, and DK are all good to go down the stretch here. Yeah, I'm with you on that. They have the pieces. I'm just not going to attach my uh, my emotional well-being 
to MLS's back Orlando City. But by God, second in the Eastern Conference, 35 points. They are 14 back of the Revs, but at this point, you're just playing for home field advantage. Uh, let's get to uh, number six, Nashville SC. Jamie Watson, unmute yourself, my man. Up a spot on Nashville after a – is it a Derby win against Atlanta? Jamie, what, what was this? Uh, it was an important win. It was a, it was a much needed win, and when I think the season is all said and done, and, and the chapter kind of closes of twenty twenty one for Nashville SC as they ran into the stretch of five out of six games on the road and the final ten out of fourteen on the road. This may be the moment where we look back and go, "This is where it all turned." And uh, it was a very important win, I think, uh, not only because it it sort of kept Atlanta from catching up and being two points behind you. And you kind of get muddled in the pack in the playoffs, but uh, but also for the psyche of the club. And as they have this big stretch of, of road games, had they not have won, the doubt continues to creep. Now that you have gone, you've tasted victory and you did it in a very convincing manner. I think that sets them up for a, a, a back end of the season that it was a win that they really needed. Are they going to thrive or dive on the road here? Jamie, like w this is sort of a, a make or break, as you as you've said here at home, no losses this season so far. Seven wins, six draws. That's positive. They're undefeated. Maybe they want some more wins from that to, to give them a cushion here. What is this road stretch going to be for Nashville? Well, so so first of all, they get NYCFC at home on Friday night, right? That's a big game because at home, as you mentioned, they've been very good. I think you'll see them go for it, try to get all three points, knowing that they're in this stretch. Not that I mean it's pretty silly to say, isn't it? Not like they're not going to go for it, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Like get back to their attacking ways and really be on the front foot from from the opening whistle against a very good NYCFC team. But then you go on the road to Montreal and to Toronto. I think those are two winnable places. Um, they've played Montreal very well. The way Montreal plays very similar to Nashville, so it becomes a lot more tactically who wins your one on one battles. And then they went to Toronto um, a couple weeks ago. Got a 1-1 result there, and it's Toronto right now. So I think you should expect uh, to go there and get more than maybe you would at other places. Then you end that stretch with Miami, um, a place that they were a header away in the 89th minute from taking all three points just a couple weeks ago. So I think that there's a, a stretch of games here that this team could really set themselves apart and really put themselves in that top four. And I promise you, you don't want Nashville – on the road in the playoffs. I think everyone in the league would attest to that. Uh, let's talk tactics a little bit because we've seen mostly sort of a 3-4-1-2 this year, though it was a little bit more of a 3-4-3 three, three, uh, this past weekend. But the, I mean, honestly, the, the headline story for me this year in Nashville has been how Hani Mukhtar, after a pretty underwhelming season as like a true number 10 last year, has really thrived as more of a second forward? Is it just a, a factor of him having less of the game play through him and more just finding space and, and being a creature of the final third? Well, Doyle, you did a really good job in the middle of the game. Uh, it was actually moments before the first goal scored. You, you clipped off a moment that showed Hani Mukhtar finding space, finding big gaps, acres of space at Mercedes-Benz Stadium between um, the Atlanta midfield three and kind of their back three, you know, with the wing backs, wherever you want to put them in that equation, he was finding a massive gap in moments before the goal actually was scored where sort of Dan Lovitz tucked in from the right side, which Gary Smith very astutely put Lovitz on the right side, put Alistair Johnson in the right center back. They overloaded that side. Lovitz cuts in. Mukhtar finds his space, slips Lovitz in. Lovely little weighted pass first time into the path of Rios, and they go into locker room up 1-0. Hani Mukhtar, for me, though, was the biggest all-star snub. Going into <laughs> the all-star game, he had eight goals and seven assists. You know, I, I think that for a designated player, those are numbers that uh, typically come with the expectation of the designated player tag. But we didn't see that last year from him. He was a very good soccer player from 18 to 18, but he always lacked the final ball. He always lacked um, the killer pass or the final touch to bury a goal. But he's found that this year, and he has been so important to this team, but equally as important has been the work rate of Randall Leal, who has gone off with Costa Rica. That'll be a big loss this weekend as well. His numbers aren't quite the same because Sapong and Mukhtar are sort of being on the end of the product, but it's Leal's work rate amongst that front three. Gary Smith can't change it. I don't know if he's in love with the 3-4-3, three, three, the 3-4-1-2, three, and, and he's going to do that for the rest of his days. 
I just think those three are so good up front. And whichever three has been playing in the back, if it's Romney, Zimmerman, Johnston, Mayer, whoever it may be, they've equally been as good. So you're not really going to change it. And they've got two losses through 21 games. I mean, who had that on their bingo card at the beginning of the season? I uh, had on my bingo card that Ake Lobo might settle a little faster. That's fair. But at the same time, Ake Lobo was not playing in Monterey before he came here. And to play in a Gary Smith side, you have to be at peak fitness because it is constantly working. It is constantly uh, putting yourself in positions to work defensively and then break out. If you absorb pressure, can you break out quickly? Can you be dangerous on the attack? And right now with the way that Leal, Sapong, and Mukhtar are playing, who would you replace in that group right now? Would you break up the continuity? I mean, he brought on Rios this week to give uh, Leal uh, an opportunity to, to start from the bench and look, that worked really well for the final 30 minutes of the game. Rios had been knocking on the door. He took the most of his opportunity. But, Doyle, you made a good point. Mokhtar switched a little bit tactically, so he set a little bit underneath, and that allowed the two forwards up top, Zapong and Rios. So tactically it was a little bit of a shift. But I think right now with how they're playing, I don't know who you replace Lobo with, and I don't think you have to force it right now. Hmm. And I, I, for what it's worth, I, I completely agree with that, though I, I would expect a little bit of squad rotation just to keep – the guys fresh down the stretch, but I assume in all of this, it means we, we've probably seen the end of John Cadiz in, in Nashville. Um, I mean, I don't think that that's a hundred percent the case, but I think Gary Smith has a plethora of options right now that, you know, if you're not scoring, you now have somebody else like Daniel Rios who had been waiting in the wings for that opportunity. And he's finally taken it. Aki Loba. He's another one. You've also got a Budan Ladi returning to fitness as well. He's not making game day rosters. There's This was the, the knock on the team last year in the narrative, right? That they didn't score enough goals, that they didn't get enough attacking options. They've got 34 goals on the season. That plus 14 goal differential is a mint. I mean, that is an incredible number through 21 games. And right now, how do you, how do you put Cadiz in over one of those three? Right now, how do you... you you don't, Jamie? And if you don't, then you don't keep them, right? Like, well, it's a good right, problem I... to have, right? It's a good problem yeah, if, good if there's so much. It, it's a it's a champagne problem right now when you've got that many forwards that you can say, yes, you've got a designated player tag. And at the time, you you make the best decisions that you can. No, at the time, it was it was a good decision. It seemed. We're just saying that at this point in time, it doesn't seem like that decision is going to hold. Yeah, and and hopefully, hopefully they can avoid injuries, and hopefully they ca- they continue this run of form where you've got very good players on the outside looking in. That's a good problem to have. And if they can maintain this run of health and, and can get by without the key players that will be gone for international duty on this tough road stretch, um, I, I don't. I, I think if this season comes to an end and Nashville find themselves in a home playoff game, I, I don't think there'll be any way in which you can't say with the way it was set up for them to have a heavy front-loaded schedule, which no coach really wants, and a heavy road schedule – uh, road schedule to end the season. If they get in, in that top four spot and have a home game, you'll have to really worry about playing them, and you'll say this team deserved it completely through and through. They've been nothing short of impressive this season. Nobody has fewer losses in the league with two. Third in the Eastern Conference right now, but this huge game coming up. The first one of the weekend on Friday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, Nashville hosting New York City. You can watch it on MLS Live on ESPN Plus from Nissan Stadium. Jamie, appreciate your time, man. We'll talk to you soon, Believe okay? You always appreciate it. Thanks for having me amongst these uh, wonderful cast of hosts and these wonderful <laughs> listeners that listen in every week. Great uh, job, guys. Uh, yeah, butter us up. Butter us up. I appreciate it. On to number five, we go Marcelo Balboa. Unmute yourself. A legend. Here to talk Rapids, who have been absolutely legendary in both the way they've built this team and how they've performed over the last two and a half years or so. Uh, Marcelo, are you there, man? Mm, I hear some background noise, so that must be Marcelo. The Rapids with the 1-1 draw this weekend, which on YouTube, you're watching the highlights here. Might have been nil-nil, might have been 1-1. I think maybe Jonathan Lewis got away with one with a little uh, handball, unintentional, to bring it down on the first goal, and then I do not buy the foul call that led to Johnny Russell's free kick, uh, no matter what. And neither does Jack Price, by the way, if you're watching on YouTube. I hope you uh, hope you can lip-read on that one. It's a very, very typical response from Jack Price. Uh, but 1-1 against Kansas City. While we wait for Marcelo, Doyle, uh, do we want to just heap some praise on the Rapids here? Because it is absolutely astounding uh, what they're accomplishing. We talked about Houston's payroll, given their, their mm-hmm. investment and their sort of like lack of DPs. They don't even seem to value that. 
Yeah, it, it's it's the Rapids way, right? That that famous uh, op-ed from a few years ago that 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 Porig wrote uh, in the local newspaper, and um, it, it's finally coming to pass. Well, it, I, I would honestly argue that it came to pass last year, and what's what's happened this year that's so remarkable is Robin Frazier has been able to change the way the team plays because last year it was so open and they were one of the more flowing and attractive attacking teams in the league and they can still do that but they're defense they're defensive team first uh this sounds like we have marcelo here yeah. hey right. boys i'm I'm, I'm, buddy. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an old man who's trying to figure out a phone <laughs> well you know what i have been known to kick people off and to mute myself and do all sorts of ridiculous things in the midst of these twitter spaces so uh give us your give us your take on the rapids way and the 2021 season so far I, we've been full of praise for this team for for a couple months now but it, you know what it should be i think that this is a team who everybody kept on saying as of a few weeks ago that it's flying into the radar um, yeah, listen, we're not the LAFCs. We're not the Galaxy. We're not the teams to spend big money. But what Robin's done over the last two years has brought a winning mentality. He has brought structure. He has brought a team that's going to fight every day, every minute of the game. It's a team that has depth that if someone goes down, you can step right in and that guy won't miss a beat. So you know, for me, this is a team that didn't play great the other day, let's be honest, but they're finding ways to get results. And I think that's that's the important part of an MLS season because it's a grind. It's a long grind. But listen, they get marquee wins when you go to L.A. and you beat L.A. there. You got a good result against Sporting Kansas City, who was number two. Uh, they're playing well at home. They're playing well on the road. Um, I said it before. Uh, we are no longer flying under the radar. And good luck coming to Altitude and playing the Colorado Rapids. Uh, let me ask you this, Marcelo, uh, and I, I agree with all of that. One of the one of the ways that I, I've I've sort of described this team to to people who have asked is it's a team with no weak links. It, almost everybody in the say top fifteen or eighteen players that Robin uses is at the very least above average. But at the same time. Um, there, there is no star, especially when it comes to, to goal scoring. Is that going to end up being an Achilles heel for this team come the stretch run, come the playoffs when, when they're facing the Seattles of the world or even this Sporting Kansas City team who they just got a very credible draw against? Um, you know, there's no Polito for this team. There's no Rui Diaz. Is that just the glaring, obvious lack for, from the outside looking in uh, for, for the Colorado Rapids side? Uh, listen, I think you always want a 20-goal score, a 15-goal score. But if you watch this team play, the way they spread the ball around well, they knock it from side to side. They're creating advantages. And, and we're talking about numerical advantages when you can isolate Barrios. And look how many times you've isolated Barrios throughout this year on a one-on-one -on -one matchup. Now, all of a sudden, you find a, an Acosta or a Mark Anthony K screaming through the box. So I think we all want a, a, a big-name goal scorer. But in the way the Rapids are built, they're dangerous down the left with Galvan or who's ever playing there. They're dangerous down the right with Barrios. We've seen Jonathan Lewis now in a new role as a nine who's become very dangerous because of his pace getting in behind. Uh, tell me a team that's got a better threesome right now on a counterattack, the way Rapids drop and they counter quickly, that, that can match what they can do. So defensively, listen, you can send bodies. You can send them. And we, yeah, you're right. We don't have a 15-goal score a year, but we've got four or five guys that can be dangerous, and especially – when you pick up a Mark Anthony K, because you look at this midfield now between Mark Anthony K, Acosta, Price, Bassett filling in, Mosquita, it, it's pretty deep. So, yeah, listen, I, it could be an Achilles heel, but I don't think it will be because this team, especially on set pieces with Price and Lawless and Danny, they're a dangerous team right now. They they are. The, the set piece performance over the last three years is remarkable, and um, they they should, you know, make a statue of Jack Price's right foot because his set piece delivery is just mind bendingly good. Uh, but so given all that you've said, right, because you've, you've made a very compelling case and obviously the play on the field has made a very compelling case. Are the Colorado Rapids, you know, barring injury, are the Colorado Rapids uh, MLS cup contenders? Yes, they are. I'll, listen, people say to me, Oh, because you're from Colorado. No, I look at it objectively. We've had many hard years here. And let's just be straight up and honest. It struggled. 
But over the last few years, and I'm going to give tons of credit to Robin, to Porik, because Robin has come in and Robin has made it very clear what he likes, what he wants. He's very good at managing minutes with the players. And uh, and again, you keep adding more weapons. When you add a Barrios, a Mark Anthony K, you got Yarbrough in the back. You start looking, trust he's probably playing the best soccer that I've seen him play. Easily. Easily. And, uh, and pro- I think should be at least looked at as one of the candidates for Defender of the Year. Um, you know what? They are. This is a team that believes in itself. This is a team you can see it every day. They, they know when they walk out on the field, they can score. They can score. And it helps. Listen, it helps having a guy like Jack Price. He'll give you a, fi- he'll give you a ring of within five feet. He's going to put the ball there every time. Somewhere in that five five foot ring, he's going to put it. Just attack it, and you put it in the back of the net. So, listen, yes, I, I think they are a team that can compete and that can fight for an MLS Cup. But I also think that we also have a candidate for Coach of the Year and Robin to give him credit because of what. And I've been here twenty five years, boys. It's been very very long time <laughs> since we've had some consistency of winning games like we have since Robin's been here. It's been a beautiful thing, and I'm still waiting. I know Sam Stage with the deep dive in the athletic for somebody to do the ultimate deep dive on the way that the Rapids and Porig have decided that Tam and Gam are actually more valuable as transfer fees than they are to buy down player contracts. That's a super interesting part of what they're doing there. They don't need a DP when they can go gather players with league experience like that. They're at the top of their games. Marcel Balbo, we appreciate you, man. Uh, we're going to number four, but we will be back to talk to you very, very soon because this Rapids team is not leaving the top ten. There you go. Take care, boys. All right. Appreciate you, Marcel. All right. On to number four we go. Sporting Kansas City. Wow, that was, we start with a little highlight of uh, the Colorado Rapids goalkeeper here, William Yarbrough. About to watch a ball go in the back of his net because Johnny Russell is magic from set pieces. Uh, Doyle, where are Kansas City right now in your mind? They've sort of just hovered around this spot all year. They've been very, yeah. very good, but not sort of best in class good, I wouldn't say. Yeah, I, I think that's about right. They're, they're top four, though. I, I would argue Seattle's come back to the pack a little bit in that in that Western Conference, and um, so it, it's there's not a there's not a huge distinction between those two teams at the moment. And as we saw in this game, there's not a huge line between uh, Sporting KC and, and the Rapids. Uh, they're really really good. They are. Uh, th- there's something missing that says to me that they're not great. And I, I can't quite pinpoint it because if you look at the underlying, if you watch the way they play, they play beautiful soccer. If you look at the underlying numbers, uh, the underlying numbers all really, really like Sporting KC. Tim Melia is back to not, maybe not quite his, you know, 2015 through 2017 apex, but he's not far off of that. He's having, you know, an exceptional year. Um, but it doesn't feel quite as overwhelming as some of this team's best seasons were. And I, you know, and that's even with Polito and Shalloway having a, a remarkable season. And I can't quite put my finger on it, Weeby. Yeah. I mean, I, when you look at their, I think it's just because they haven't sort of sustained the excellence. They had a seven game stretch where they had six wins. And then since yeah. then, it's like, it's three wins in 11 games and a lot of draws and a lot of moments where you might have expected them to take all those points, you know, it's three straight draws. So I think there's some recency bias to that. But I also just think if you look at the teams that, you know, I said, look, they're not best in class. If they're not best in class, they're on the precipice of it. You know, look, the Sounders haven't been able to sustain. They're going to fall back a little bit. They have a worse home record than do Sporting Kansas City and basically the same away record. The Revs, somehow, some way they've sustained. It's just been a, I just think it's, it's, I don't know. It's just, it's a consistency with their results. Because the talent is there, the ability is there, the back line is now there, Tim Melia is there, they haven't even had Polito consistently all season, Johnny Russell hasn't been at his best all season, I think maybe that's that's what that feeling is, is like, you're looking at a team that's third or fourth best in the league, and yet a lot of their sort of like expected uh, star players haven't been at the level that we expected, but they're still doing this. So I go back to what we were talking about with Orlando City, which is you were saying, I expect them to sort of round into this form and I expect Poppy to have them prepared for this. And and that's part of what I think Peter Vermees was saying with the League's Cup. As much as it hurt to see them throw it away, (laughs) he was just sort of like, hey, you know what? All season long, we haven't really been at our best. We've sort of, we haven't cobbled it together necessarily, but we have had a ton of injuries. I'm actually going to prioritize being at our very best in October and November 
and then maybe we'll see that team that it kind of feels like both of us, you know, we see it in our mind's eye and we see it in flashes, but yeah. haven't seen it consistently enough to say like, bam, you're right there. You are arguably the best team in the league, even though I would say that they are. Yeah, I, I think that's that's well put. And it just, that honestly just might be a factor of, of 2021 in MLS with the compressed schedule and the multiple competitions. Um, you're not going to have your best Forget best eleven. You know, you're not going to have eleven of your best fifteen available. Uh, I mean, they sold their often. starting six. Yeah, yeah. Middle of the season. You they, know, they but, but to go to yeah. to go to how well constructed this team is, they'd known that for a while. And Peter had gone out and gotten Remy Walter, who's been decent, not great. I would say they go mm -hmm. out and get Maury. Like they have the pieces to step in and and fill that out. But they are still relying on some older players and Roger and Ilya and Fontas, etc. Is he Matt Marine, another guy who's just been injured? sort of off and on this whole season that was supposed to be the rock next to Fontas. Polito, same deal. Like, you know, Peter Vermees has got to get PS PTSD when he sees Mexico rosters come out. He's like, my God, I mean, if you're going to take him, play him. Like, but don't take him from us so often and then don't play him. Yeah. We can agree, though, I, I think that if this team is whole, so that means Fontas still healthy, is a Matt Marine next to him, uh, Roger Espinosa. Yeah. Uh, obviously, Melia, but then it, it really does come down to that center back pairing of, of, of Fontas and Izumat Marine, and then Polito being healthy and available up top. If they have that, and like most of the other pieces around them, this is an MLS. This is a, a top four team in the league and an obvious MLS Cup contender. Is will be, et cetera, et cetera. They are, and they are, in my opinion, in the top three. Yeah. To me, it's New England, Seattle, and Kansas City. And then you have a second tier down that, that they're kind of scrabbling to get into, whether that be the Rapids or the Galaxy or Orlando or Nashville. Maybe NYCFC finds himself as a floater right now. But it is unquestionable to me that Kansas City are among the top three leagues teams in the league, despite them being number four in these power rankings <laughs> and dropping. Look, you know, it's, it's the draw. Again, they've got three straight draws. So there's some recency bias to that as well. But this is an incredible team. I would not be shocked if they were lifting MLS Cup. At the end, let's go to number three. And we've got uh, NYCFC right here. they got a big game this weekend, up two spots. They're up two spots because they beat the best team in the league on points uh, by a wide margin, the Revs, at home, 2 nothing. I'm Team Tati, been Team Tati, Doyle, always Team Tati. Two goals in this one, but it's feast and famine sometimes with him. But when they're feasting, New York City are arguably the best team in the league. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, the underlying numbers say they are the best team in the league and, and that the only thing that separated them uh, from from the top of the standings is the fact that uh, Tate Castellanos is as brilliant as he is at finding chances and, and being parts of build, uh, you know, build ups that, that create good chances. Um, he's left a ton of goals on the table. Uh, and, you know, the last time they played the Revs, Matt Turner was the goal, the player of the week. Um, because he stoned Castellanos three or four times, including a penalty kick. Uh, and that was just like a vintage ta Tati performance. This time, uh, Tati finished his chances. Uh, and, and when he finishes his chances, this team is damn near unbeatable. And so I, I'm just going to bang the same drum that I've been banging all year long, which is how you rate at this NYCFC side um, comes down to what you think of Tati Castellanos. If you think oh he's going to play like he did but this when he's weekend, on, oh. yeah. When, when he's, he's on, it's irresistible. Well, but that's as the a, thing, Weeby. Like, he's on. He's on every week. He plays like this every week. The question is, is he going to finish? And you know, there, there's a a lot of data that says it's not an on-off thing uh, with finishing, especially with one-touch finishing. It's just like eventually guys regress to the mean in one direction or another. Now, there is a really good thread that our guy Tootle Raman put up yesterday on Twitter talking about confidence intervals in terms of uh, overperformance and underperformance with regard to expected goals. And in you know recent MLS history, there are only two worse finishers than Tata Castellanos, Andrew Wenger and Quincy Ameriqua. Uh, you know, and so looking at those numbers, you say, okay, that you know, suggests that he is as, you know, you are what your missed sitters say you are. Um, but then there's a huge volume of data that says eventually finishers regress to the mean. And in 
Tatis Che. He be he wouldn't be regressing. He would, would, would it be an egress. What would he, be would, he would progress to the mean, but you oh, get yeah, yelled at by egress. the. You what get, would egress be? What I because you're about to egress to vacation. Um, uh, but you know, it, with Tat, I mean, it, it's one of those things that is going to be fascinating to watch because he will absolutely win you games. But then he will absolutely take points off the table with his inability to convert the type of chances that he converted this weekend. Has Ronnie Dyla got enough credit? No. <laughs> no. Yeah, it and, just seems it seems so quiet around Ronnie Dyla and and you know, every everybody's on the like, oh man, Bruce Arena, builder of MLS Cup teams, oh Peter Vermees, you know, sustaining success. Oscar Preha, we went on a love fest with him earlier in this show. I mean, Brian Schmetzer is in sort of the, this is the ultimate Brian Schmetzer vintage so far. But Ronnie Dyla, it's been so quiet around him, whether it be in praising the New York City style of play and what they do, or even just throwing him out there as like among the best coaches in the league. Well, those other guys you named all have trophies, right? That's, that's and this is this is Ronnie Dyla's second year in, 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 you know, in MLS with NYCFC. And he has this team playing like a trophy contender. And it's not just um, Tate who, who's taken a huge step forward. I mean, Jesus Medina actually looks like a, a DP. And he was a damn near useless player. He seemed like a bust. To three it years. seemed like he was going to be a bust. So rescuing that, Keaton Parks has taken a huge step forward. I mean, I think he deserves a lot of credit for James Sands. James Sands was not a good passer of the ball. He was really, really timid under previous coach. And I mean, under Dome Torrent in particular, because that's who he got, you know, the most minutes under. Um, and if you look at him now, this game against the Revs, James Sands was playing as a regista. He, he was like, he was doing the old Michael Bradley thing. He's not Michael Bradley's, you know, peak Michael Bradley level in terms of his passing range, but he looks nothing like the player he did a couple of years ago. So the development of those young players with NYCFC, um, and then the level that they're perform the overall team is performing at, beating the, the the crap out of the Revs. And now, granted, the Revs are missing some, some very important pieces, um, but beating the crap out of the Revs in the way that nobody's beaten the Revs really this year. Uh, Dyla deserves a lot of credit, but he's not going to get it until there uh, until there's a, a trophy in the cabinet somewhere. That, that's just the way it goes. Statement time going to Nashville on Friday, seven thirty p.m. Eastern. You heard us talk to Jamie Watson about Nashville and what they're doing. They have the fewest losses in the league this year. They're unbeaten at home. So this is a big one in the Eastern Conference. It's 3-4, and four, I believe, 7.30, MLS Live on ESPN+. Plus. Check that one out. At number three, New York City rising up two spots after knocking down the Revs, who are missing Carly Seal and Tejon Buchanan. We'll talk to Tom Bogart about them in just a second. We got Steve Zakwani here with us to talk number two. The Seattle Sounders, who stay right there at, at that spot despite losing a rivalry match. Steve, the voters must just love these sounders. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, uh, on, on a disappointment scale of 1 to 10, where does this weekend's loss to, to Portland at home rank? Uh, to be honest with you, I would say it's honestly no more than maybe a 6. Obviously, you want to win that game because you're playing. But the bigger picture of it is you're still sitting in a good position. Um, your guys are getting healthier. So it, it didn't mean too much. I don't think so. Uh, one of the things that, that is starting to mean a bit is the, the lack of goal scoring. And over the last nine games, um, if you take away that, that 6-2 drubbing of the Timbers a couple of weeks back, Seattle's been shut out three times. They've scored more than a single goal in a game just once. Um, and, and while the 3-5-2, which is more of a 3-4-2-1 now, while it's worked on a lot of levels, it has kind of left Raul Ruiz Diaz as the only man out there um, with a with a good goal scoring record from open play, um, felt like Portland kind of took advantage of that this week. They they dared Seattle to to bang down the you know to bang down the door, and they weren't able to do it. No, that's that's a very good point. And I think to to be fair, if we talk just about Portland, in the last few times they've been up there to Seattle, they've played them very well. Um, Portland, I think, is at their best without the ball, sitting back on the counter. And when you give that team something to defend, which ultimately Seattle did, I think it becomes very difficult to break that team down. And Seattle haven't been that great this year 
at breaking teams down that sit back. Look at the home record for Seattle. It's one of the worst um, in the entire MLS existence. So there's something to be said for that. I do think with um, Nico Ladero back, he's not yet completely up to speed. He looks good, but those of us who've seen him here in Seattle, there's still more gears to go. Once he gets back, that will unlock Raul in, in a lot of ways as well. But the lack of goals is concerning. It's concerning. I think it's too late in the season to now go back on a formation change. So you kind of, you've made your bed, you've got to lay with it. And I, I'm not overly concerned that by the time we get to October and then into November, this team won't find the goals they need. Though. Do you think... Go ahead. No, go maybe ahead. let me take... Yeah. So do you think that this is all kind of setting up for this team's eventual best look to be that three-five-two, except with Christian Roldan, who's been so good as that sort of number 10, almost like a false number 10, having him drop deeper next to Jao Paulo, have Ladero be the sole number 10, and then Freddie Montero comes into the lineup as a second forward kind of underneath, sometimes alongside Rui Diaz. Because Freddie's 34, 35, but he's, he's had he's, he's had blast. a lot of games this year where he's looked 24, 25 in terms of how he's been moving. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I Listen, I love Christian Rodon anywhere, to be honest. He's a fantastic player. But this team, at their very best, if you're talking about a one-off playoff game you have to win, he's got to play next to Joao Paulo. I think those two then become one of the better, if not the best duo in MLS. as just two fantastic individual footballers. And then with Nico in front of them, that midfield three becomes very tough to play against. Montero, I think he's ahead of Will Brin right now. But mm. ironically, Rui Diaz plays better with Will Bruin next to him. He actually performs much better when he's next to Will Bruin because Will takes a lot of the hits. He can hold the ball up well. He then allows runners to go in behind. And the team actually sometimes has a better balance with Will Bruin there. But you can't argue that Freddie has earned those minutes as of now. And they've missed Stefan Fry most of the year. People are paying set would argue he's the best keeper in the league. You know, that's up for debate. He's up there. And then also Nuhu who was playing at a best 11 level for me for the second year running, he's not been there for a long time. So once those guys get back and up to speed, there's not many weaknesses in this team. And then you now start talking about depth with Brad Smith and Madranda on one side. And Alex Rodon has been fantastic. Kellen Rowe has been a good signing. So I think the optimism here in Seattle is because we know what this team can be when everyone gets fit and where they are now in a lot of ways with the squad they've had. They've in some ways overachieved. It's to me when I'm watching this game, and I know the Sounders are losing it, and they they did lose it, but it's sort of absurd to me the guys that just sort of cycle off this bench, and either guys that maybe you thought it was kind of over for that maybe the motivation was gone or maybe the time was gone for like Kellen Rowe might have been one of those guys, and now he looks like this just sort of dynamo. And then you have Will Bruin that can come off, and Freddie Montero comes on, and and it's just it keeps going for them. There's waves and waves and waves, and you mentioned that there's still more to come. I mean, Leo Chu got introduced at halftime of this one. Jordan Morris is, I believe, Stephen, like full training and and could be an impact player for this team either down the stretch or maybe even the playoffs. Steph Fry, we we think he's going to get back. How much could this team change personnel wise in the next couple months? Yeah, you're talking about still missing, for sure, two starters right now who will come back, and that's Nuhu and Stefan Fry, for sure. Jordan Morris is much more of a question mark. You know, we'd have to see exactly where he's at, but that's someone who walks into this team. You know, it's the second he's fit, he's, he's, he's on the team as well. And you're talking also about Nico Ladero, who's missed most of the season. He's still getting up to speed. He looks good, but this guy can play even better. So three starters coming back who are, you know, all-star level players in this league. And I think you're talking about a team as well that's very well organized. The formation defensively has worked wonders and you don't have to win games 3-4-0 all the time. This team's now built. They can win, go on the road and grind out a 1-0 win here and there. And so I think there's very few weaknesses when I really look at that, especially that midfield with Christian, Joao Paulo, Nico Ladero. Which team wouldn't want that trio? Alex Rodon's been a revel revelation on the right. Between Brasme from Madrana, you'll get production on that side as well. Montero, as you mentioned, has come in and been better than most of us here expected him to be. And then Rui Diaz is Rui Diaz. So not many weaknesses. The defeat, yes, yeah, disappointing. I think bigger picture, the reason no one's overreacting is because the team, the team still sits pretty, has probably overachieved with what they've had available. And now that the, all, all the big guns are coming back and you will be at full strength to close out these final 10-plus games, um, not many teams want to see Seattle at their, at their best. 
Just a suggestion. If you're an MLS GM out there, I don't know, you got a burner account, you're listening here, you're thinking about it, and Garth Lagerway hits you up. He shoots you a text, he gives you a call, he says, hey, you know this guy that you're not using that much? Like, I, We would take him. We would Don't do it. <laughs> Hold on to him, because either he's going to be great for them, or he could be good for you, or somewhere in between, but they have really found a way to pick up some pieces here. When is Steph Fry going to be back? That's my last one for you, Steve. Because we saw the highlights here. Stephen Cleveland has been good, but I mean, you want to have Steph Fry in the goal in the, in the high leverage moments. You, you do want to have Steph Fry back. And I would say, look, I think what we're talking here is now just a matter of weeks and probably less than two or three weeks here. And I'm not exactly sure, but I think Stephen Fry, you have to make sure he's fully ready mm -hmm. because, you know, he had a couple of setbacks here and there and you don't want to take risks with that. Cleveland's been um, good enough that you don't have to rush Steph Fry back, but he makes a big difference. This is a team that hadn't conceded through open play through like 13 games so Stefan Fry is a big reason for that and he when he comes back he'll make a big difference back there I actually think the player that missed the most is Nuhu because when Nuhu came I mean he, he could defend that whole left side by himself he played as a left center back and a left back at the same time he wanted to take on two players at one time that freed up the left winger whether Brad Smith or Madranda to be more attacking without Nuhu there the cover's not been there those guys have been forced back a bit more but between Steph Fry and Nuhu that takes you defense from maybe a seven up to a nine or a ten and then you, you know the guys in attack are going to do what they're going to do and that's when this team will be back to the best all right taking a break this weekend are the seattle sounders got a lot of guys gone for international duty that's just the hallmark of a good team steve zakwani as zakwani 11 on twitter steve always a pleasure to talk with you man uh thanks guys thanks for having me uh, just so you know, Steve, I've been doing some kickboxing lately. Just uh, inspired by you. I don't know. Uh, they say my they say my kicks aren't that good, so I'll have to get some lessons from you next time. All right. All uh, right. Send me send me send me a video. I'll nope. Help you up. nope. 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 <laughs> after what's after what Stu Holden did to me, I don't send those videos out. No, no. That's got to it's got to disappear from the face of the earth. All right. Seattle at number two. Great to talk to you, Steve. We're on to number one. Tom Bogert's been sitting there patiently waiting. New England Revolution. Number one, that's an easy choice, even though they lost this weekend. Still 49 points. Still the only team in the league averaging more than two points per game. Tom, are you there, man? Yeah, I'm here. But can I forego my time here and just listen to you talk about your kickboxing classes more? Because I, I... No, you, no, nobody wants nobody wants to nobody wants to hear that. But if you insist. No, I'm just kidding. If, if you insist. Uh, shout out to my wife, Mindy, for uh, making me go do that and get off my butt here at home. <laughs> uh, the Rebs this weekend, losers in New York City without heel, without Tejan. I'm going to throw it to both of you. Who has a stronger take on what this means for the Rebs, if anything at all? Well, go ahead, Tom. Doyle's the hot take manager here, but like most, like I'm going to go with nuance with I, I don't think that it means anything. Like New York City FC are a really good team and they were pretty much full strength. And New England without Carlos Hill and, and Tejan Buchanan is, is not the same team. And, and, and Gustavo Bo coming off the bench, like, it's, it's disappointing because I was looking forward to that game, but you can't read too much into it when, what, three of their four, three of their five best players are out? How yeah, much were you really looking forward to it, though, Tom? Because this was a Hawaiian shirt night that you didn't attend, though you are in the tri-state area. So can we really say that you were looking forward to this match? Look, that's just poor foresight for me. And look, mistakes happen throughout the year. All you have to do is, you know, put your head down, work hard, go back to the training ground, and, and hope I do better next time. <laughs> Doyle, what's your current uh, your current stance on New England, and do you uh, think we're going to see heel soon? Because we see him climbing off buses, smiling. He was either vacationing in Spain <laughs> or healing up a hernia issue, a groin issue over the last month and a half. We don't know. We'll never know, probably. Yeah, maybe it was a, a little bit of both. Um, I yeah, I, I have no idea because you know the Revs have not been transparent at all about. This, this kid's injury status and um, obviously they've missed him, but it says a lot about how good this team is and how well the roster is constructed. They were, I mean, they were eight Oh and one in their previous nine games. And I think six of those were without heel. Um, so to, to have that kind of run without the guy who I still have him atop the MVP rankings. Um, but he's the difference between the revs being a really good team that can go out and get results because they're dynamic in transition and because they have the league's best goalkeeper um, and a team that can actually go out there and can control games against almost anybody in the league. The, Heel is their Ladero in that sense, and um, he's been just incredible in the final third. It needs to be said, though, the other piece missing from this game uh, was Matt Polster. 
And like he eventually got on the field in the second half. He played a little bit of right back because Brandon Bay is also out. Um, I, again, no clarity from the revs on, on for how long or even what the nature of the injury is. Uh, but Matt Polster has been low key, one of the very best defensive midfielders in the league this year. And I think it goes back to the discussion that we had um, about Orlando, about, you know, sporting KC and, and, you know, about just about every contending team in this league is like Bruce arena has had to manage injuries and absences. And the, the, the goal is to, Obviously, to for the Revs, if you're sitting in a pole position, the goal is to get that supporter shield, but it's also to make sure that you don't overwork your team to the point that they break down. And, and Bruce has done a pretty incredible job of that in 2021. And it's why even after, you know, all the absences that they've had, they still, I mean, they, they have eyes on their first ever supporter shield. This team has been around since day one and they got the logo to prove it. And they have never won the Supporters Shield before, and it's within their grasp. Um, and it would be a hell of an accomplishment during the season with the compressed schedule. By the way, they go to Philly this weekend on Friday. You can double box that one with Nashville, New York City on MLS Live on ESPN+. Plus. Those are two really, really big matchups in the Eastern Conference. Philly trying to figure their way back and survive a little bit here, and New England just trying to keep thriving. They're 6-3-3 three, and three on the road right now. You want to tell us anything about Tejan? Uh, Tom or Club Bruges and the amount of scouting they're doing on Major League Soccer? Yeah, um, they've, they've definitely been involved heavily. Um, obviously, signing Tejan, they were um, they had a deal that was really close for Diego Rossi that kind of fell through late. You know, it, it was something that was, you know, final stages or, or whatever. I, I don't know exactly what the hurdle was or where it tripped up, but that it was something that, you know, I don't think that it was a Tejan or Diego situation because both like their interest in Tejan has been for months and months and months. And they were close with Tejan while the, the Diego Rossi deal was being discussed. So that just shows that they really and truly do like not just scout MLS, but they're, they, they value the talent. And, and I guess that they see maybe a market inefficiency, if you can call it that. I thought that 7 million plus, you know, sell on clause for Tejan Buchanan is, is fair, especially with New England being able to keep them for a few more months. Um, so I'm not sure how much of an inefficiency that might be, but, they're at least realizing that or one of the, I guess, premier teams that are realizing that the performances and the talent can transcend to Europe. And, and you can look at these performances and kind of get a pretty good gauge on, on the player and the competition for where he'll be going. Tom, you mentioned Tom. Diego Rossi, um, the, the move to, to Club Bruges that fell through. Now there's talk about move to Fenerbahce. Uh, be a at this point, it's, it's fully graduated. I think Fenerbahce is tweeting it. So do we have do we have the the official transfer fee number on that? Um, this one is is pretty complicated. Um, it's technically going to be a loan at first, with the expectation of purchase. And I know that sounds weird and vague, but um, you know the LFC are planning for him to not be coming back, uh, to say the least, and more so than they were with with Brian Rodriguez, because they're the way it was described to me is that they pretty much already kind of put this off. And and what I can say about the fee is nothing direct, but but I can say that the Club Bruges deal was around eight to ten million. And if they were accepting eight to ten million, you know, a week and a half ago, that should give you a good idea about what the ballpark of where this fee is from Fenner. I am uh, hugely encouraged by clubs like Salzburg, like Bruges coming in and expressing a lot of interest for MLS players. And I think this was always going to be the first step. And feel free to jump in and, and correct me, Tom or Doyle, if you if you disagree here. We all want to see sort of direct to big four, big five league transfers uh, from MLS players and homegrown players. But I'm very encouraged to see sort of those like clearing houses in mm -hmm. Europe, the ones that bring them in at five to seven or even less and sell them on for 15 to 30, uh, decide that this is a market that they really can make some hay on. That to me, th those are skilled practitioners in the market. We may not be quite there yet as a league, but those folks know what they're doing, what they're talking about, and and what players are going to translate down the line, and what players will thrive in in their environment, and then be worth a lot more. Uh, I am I'm hugely encouraged that those are the type of places that are interested in MLS players right now and are making those moves. And I just think this is the beginning of what's going to be a whole hell of a lot of fun for people like Tom to do the work, and for people like me to sit back and enjoy it. So uh, I'm I'm hugely encouraged, and uh, also. Uh, encouraged uh, by the quality in this top 10 on the power rankings. If you guys have anything else, we could talk it. If you don't, let's call this thing good. What do you think? I think we wrap it up.
Wrap it up. Here's your top 10 for week 22. You can find the full 27 at MLSsoccer.com and the MLS app. Number one, New England. Two, Seattle. Three, New York City. Four, Kansas City. And five, Colorado. Wrapping up the top 10 are Nashville at six, Orlando at seven, Minnesota at eight, LA Galaxy at nine, and DC United at 10. They were the biggest risers in the top 10 after beating the Union. Plus three for DC United. There are nine games this weekend. There is also a ton of action around CONCACAF and the world. World Cup qualifying starting Thursday, U.S., El Salvador, Canada, Honduras. Uh, pre-game before that U.S. game, they'll break down Canada and Honduras and talk the lineup for Greg Berhalter against El Salvador. Then the full post-game show afterwards on all the MLS channels. Uh, and that's for every single U.S. game of this World Cup qualifying cycle. We're here for it with you. Hope you enjoy these power rankings show. Hit me up if you have any thoughts at Andrew underscore Weeby suggestions, etc. With that, adios. Have a great Tuesday, everybody.